for knowledge and free will. Are they compatible? That is the question we'll look at on this episode of The Sci-Fi Show. If you've never watched the brilliant British sci-fi comedy series Red Dwarf, then you should definitely make time to do so. It's extremely funny and deals with all sorts of fun questions in very humorous ways. Red Dwarf, for those who haven't seen it, is based on a series of books by Grant Naylor, a pseudonym for the authors Rob Grant and Doug Naylor. They tell the tale of hapless space bum Dave Lister and his quest to get back to Earth that gets further and further off track. The TV series that was based on the books remains true to the basic idea, and it's an all-round good watch. On this episode, I want to explore an idea from Season 8 of the show. Lister and his companions, Christine Kachansky, Arnold Rimmer, Crichton, and Kat, find themselves accidentally volunteering for a prison suicide squad called the Canaries, that's given the job of exploring dangerous situations that are not worth risking less expendable people on. On this mission, they encounter a derelict spaceship that has an advanced computer aboard named Cassandra. It turns out that Cassandra has been abandoned because she is a computer capable of predicting the future with perfect accuracy. She astounds Lister and Cohort by offering a series of predictions that all come true. The most disturbing of these is the knowledge that all of the Canaries will die except for Lister, Crichton, Kat and Kachansky. Rumor is less than thrilled with this turn of events. The episode is full of humour based around what certain knowledge of the future entails, with the realisation for most of them that until they leave the ship they cannot be killed. Cassandra knows they will survive, so nothing they can do will succeed in getting themselves killed, no matter how stupid. Likewise, there's a truly inspired plot development when Rimmel learns that he will die at Lister's hand when Lister finds him making love to Kachansky, Lister's series-long love interest. The scene where Rumor is attempting to seduce Kachansky with an appeal to the predetermined outcome is hilarious, as Kachansky has no intention or desire to sleep with Rumor. The episode is worth watching for all these escapades and great ideas that flow from some of the things entailed by an infallible knowledge of the future. So what is foreknowledge? Foreknowledge is simply a knowledge of the future. It doesn't really present any problem except in the case where the foreknowledge is infallible, where it isn't possible for the source of the foreknowledge to be wrong about what it knows. Normally this sort of foreknowledge is attributed to deities, who have the property of omniscience. Omniscience is a broader idea that entails knowing all true propositions, and includes foreknowledge in the case where there are future tensed propositions that have a truth value. Omniscience is an interesting idea and we will have to revisit it in a future episode. One question that comes up if you think about foreknowledge for a little while is the question, what would it be like to have such a thing? Would you simply remember events that have not yet come to pass, in much the same way we normally experience memories of events that have passed? Would it contain the usual context that memories have, or would it appear as the episode suggests Cassandra experiences it, just as pictures that still need to be understood and interpreted, sort of like watching them on a movie screen? Would it even be possible to experience this sort of knowledge in a sequential fashion at all? One understanding of the way a being like God experiences knowledge is the idea that all time is present simultaneously as one all-encompassing now, rather than a series of linear events to be experienced. Perhaps this is what it's like for Cassandra. So what does infallible foreknowledge of the future mean for free will? That's really where the issue arises. Are we simply actors on a stage playing our parts? Historically, there's been a school of thought known as fatalism that says we're at the whim of the gods, or God, or the fates, and there's nothing we can do about it. All we can do is resign ourselves to this reality and make the best of things, because nothing we can do will really make a difference. Fatalism has been found in different ways in different religions and philosophical traditions down through history. Compatibilism offers a way to resolve the problem by denying that the sort of determinism that infallible foreknowledge suggests is a problem for free will. But if we assume a requirement of some sort of libertarian conception of free will to be necessary, 
then the argument for fatalism goes something like this. 1. Yesterday Cassandra infallibly believed that Rimmer would die of a heart attack in her presence. This is true from the supposition of infallible foreknowledge. 2. Cassandra's knowledge of Rimmer dying of a heart attack occurred in the past, which it did because she already knew it. Then it is now necessary that Rimmer's death will occur because of the principle of the necessity of the past. 3. It is now necessary that yesterday Cassandra believed Rimmer would die of a heart attack from steps 1 and step 2. 4. Necessarily, if Cassandra believed Rimmer would die of a heart attack, then Rimmer will die of a heart attack from the definition of what it means to be infallible. 5. If Cassandra's knowledge is necessary, and necessarily Cassandra's knowledge implies the necessity of the event, then Rimmer's heart attack is now necessary from the transfer of necessity principle. 6. So it's now necessary that Rimmer will die of a heart attack from steps 3, 4, and 5. 7. If it is now necessary that Rimmer die of a heart attack, then he cannot do otherwise. That's what it means for it to be necessary. 8. Therefore, Rimmer is going to die at the appointed hour, and it can't be otherwise, from steps 6 and 7. 9. If Rimmer can't do other than die of a heart attack at the appointed hour, then he cannot act freely. Libertarian free will requires this. It's the principle of alternate possibility. 10. Therefore, Rimmer will die of a heart attack and will not be free to do otherwise from steps 8 and 9. I do realise the obvious observation, people don't choose to die from a heart attack, but at least in this sense, the actions are chosen because it is the knowledge that he must die of a heart attack that causes his death from a heart attack. At least, it causes Not's death from a heart attack because Cassandra thinks Not is Rimmer. A wonderful sidestep of the problem, I thought. Still, I'm sure you can see how the basic idea flows through and can be applied to any more general example, and I just thought this one illustrated the idea nicely. Traditionally, the question of foreknowledge is a religious one, but the existence of time travel might also create the issue. Also, if you consider something like the Bajoran prophets, they seem to have foreknowledge of this sort, even though they are not fully-fledged deities in the traditional sense. So are there any answers to this argument for fatalism from the existence of foreknowledge? Turns out that there are several possible answers to the question, and unpacking the individual ones will make excellent topics for a future show. But let's take a look at an overview of some of the basic solutions to the problem. To avoid the problem and preserve libertarian free will, you're going to need to show one of the steps are wrong, or more likely show that one of the premises is false. The argument doesn't appear to make any obvious mistakes in logical reasoning after all. The premises that are open to attack 1, 2, 5 and 9, and historically people have offered some reasons for thinking that they aren't true. The most basic challenge is one proposed by the Christian philosophers Boethius and Thomas Aquinas. The solution to the problem was to claim that God doesn't exist in time, so to describe his knowledge as foreknowledge is a misnomer. Boethius was a proponent of the idea that God perceived all of time as one great now, rather than experiencing it as a series of ordered events as we do. The very idea of God having knowledge before an event is meaningless because God doesn't experience time in this manner. I'm not sure if this is a satisfying answer, as it would seem that even if God experienced all time as now, we don't, and it makes sense to speak of foreknowledge relative to our experience. William of Ockham suggested a different solution, and attacked premise two of the argument. William denied that God's knowledge in the past of the future made the future event necessary in the required sense. That the necessity of the past didn't apply to something like foreknowledge, because foreknowledge is not strictly about the past. I'm still struggling with exactly what this would mean, but the position has had a number of adherents, including the influential modern Christian philosopher Alvin Plantinga. The fifth premise hasn't really been attacked historically, although some think that the Spanish Jesuit philosopher Luis de Molina did attack it. Molina's solution to the problem was encompassed in an idea he called middle knowledge. One of the ideas is that foreknowledge of future contingent events does not make them necessary in the required manner. I'm not sure how well this argument works, but it's certainly an interesting idea, and I will be returning to it in a future episode. Finally, the ninth premise is often disputed, and the claim is made that the knowledge of future events does not require that the person could not choose otherwise. At most, it would demand that they did not choose otherwise. 
I do actually find this quite a satisfying solution to the problem, although it does hinge on a fairly fine distinction. Is there a difference between couldn't and didn't choose other than they did? I would say there is, but from the outside it's difficult to see how that they are not identical. But perhaps that is the problem, perhaps that is the wrong point of view. I hope you found this overview of foreknowledge interesting, and you can find more information on the different ideas contained in this episode in the show notes on scifishow.com. And if you've never seen Red Dwarf, you can find links to purchase it from Amazon in the show notes. I can be reached with comments via feedback at scifishow.com. You can leave a comment in the show notes at scifishow.com, and you can also leave comments on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash scifishow. You can also follow the show via The Sci-Fi Show on Twitter. If this is a topic you'd like me to look into, please don't hesitate to ask. And don't forget, it's fire with a PH. Let me know what you think. Sci-Fi Show is recorded under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 3.0 license and the music is provided by Furious J and Michael M. The Sci-Fi Show is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, interface Christianity with the world, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.